two fish. You're a swine motherfucker asshole. You probably don't like yourself. And you're a two-faced opportunist, you eater cocksucker bastard. In another country, they will cut your hands for the insult after insult of the president, you moron. So, I do get fan mail. My real name is Dwayne Booth. My professional name is Mr. Fish, Senor Piscato to my Spanish-speaking friends. I've been called a political co cartoonist, but I'm really a, uh, a son of a bitch. I have always been able to draw. So I was always drawing for myself. I guess it was a kind of, of meditation. I never was that interested in sports or doing anything that other guys were doing. I would draw inappropriate things or lovely things. You know, the world's a complicated and interesting place, so if I can draw every detail of it, I've got a lifetime to attempt it. Cartooning remains one of the greatest techniques for communicating ideas. Period. I approach my work with an outlaw mentality uh, because I don't trust the law. The conventional way of looking at things is, is usually the, uh, the political way of looking at things. It's the sanitized, branded version of the truth that I think everybody is encouraged to believe in. But until you um, cross the line and go on to the other side, of mainstream thinking. That gives you a 3D uh, perspective on what you're actually trying to consider. The JFK cartoon, where he's wearing the hoodie, came right after Trayvon Martin was killed. With the justification for it being, well, he looked suspicious, he had a hoodie on. So that's what I wanted to do with that cartoon, was just like say, oh, let's, let's make something as historically shocking as the JFK assassination. Let's make it look like it makes sense simply by putting a hoodie on him. And then you'll be able to recognize how ridiculous that argument is and like in, the, in uh, you know, a modern day sense. If you were alive during the early 70s, there was a lot more hope than there is now. There was the manifestation of all of the work that went into the civil rights movement and the uh, gay rights movement, which was also a civil rights movement, and the feminization of society was also really taking root and, and having obvious expression in the culture. So when I was growing up, I couldn't wait to grow up because um, I saw all of these things that from the past were finally being shaken out. All the nonsense and the bullshit was finally being called nonsense and bullshit. And I was ready to reap the rewards of living much more honestly and sane in a saner society. I am furious at the fact that, that all of those sacrifices seem like a waste of time. We're backwards. In order to exhibit yourself as a leftist, it seems now, or even just, just claim allegiance to what is called the left, all you have to do is maybe scissor up the, the plastic six-pack rings that you have and send them out into the ocean, you know, that's, or, or you can use your reusable shopping bags and fill them with factory farm foods and put them in your SUV and you're, a, you're an environmentalist. You know, and even on the other end, if you think about it, the, 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 if you want to be uh, seen as pro-American, just demonstrate real discomfort around uh, Hispanic people. You know, it's all that kind of shorthand that people people brand themselves with these with these concepts of, of who they are and what they are without any demonstration that goes uh, deeper than um, than f fashion. The, the Norman Rockwell parody that I, I made, it's, it's based on his triple self-portrait. You know, Norman Rockwell represents Americana, he represents, uh, you know, a benign, well-meaning, wholesome America, which is a way to look at America if you have an uncritical mind. And I think that the uncritical mind, when it refuses to look at the uh, endemic racism that's in this country, for me, it's an, it's an absolute accurate depiction of what goes on when it comes to people claiming for themselves what real America is. It's white wholesomeness that can sometimes manifest itself in very ugly racism. 
I would argue that the majority of jokes work and function really well and are thrilling to people because they're really the most blatant form of truth telling that you can offer. The fact that I go after both sides of the aisle, it depends who's in the White House <laughs> as far as my popularity. Uh, for example, when I was cartooning a lot about what was wrong with uh, the Bush administration and the invasion of Iraq and you know everything that was going on there, um, I was hugely popular with the, the liberal press, hugely popular. And then uh, when Obama came in and I continued attacking the office and you know both foreign and domestic policy, there was plenty when Obama was was president to disdain. I got death threats from the left, where before I was getting death threats from the right. One of the other cartoons that I've gotten a lot of blowback from is the cartoon I did of, of Obama holding back uh, attack dogs uh, that are attempting to maul Martin Luther King. If you look at the policies of um, Barack Obama and you look at what Martin Luther King found disdainful. You would see that if Martin Luther were, were alive today, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that he would be a very, very, very vocal critic of Obama. There's a certain segment of my fan base that wants me to address the Trump situation similarly uh, to how other cartoonists are addressing it, which is only to do cartoons that portray Trump as a clown or a monster in, in a way that ignores the fact that they don't have to consider how complex the problem is. So when I create a Trump cartoon, I want to create a, a, an understanding that we're fucked in every, a, every way imaginable. Look at the arithmetic. You know, the question of being feeling safe in my profession. And I have, as I've said, I've gotten hate mail and I have get, gotten death threats. The majority of the death threats that I've gotten, I've been able to gauge, engage with the, these people because it's been through email uh, to the point where they uh, apologize for, for threatening to kill me, which is nice. When I heard about the Charlie Hebdo massacre, uh, you know, bone-crushing dread and sorrow over the incident aside, I was jealous of a publication that had a number of cartoonists under the under a roof that could convene a editorial meeting. I'm like, wow, you know, that is amazing. I don't know of a American publication that has a group of cartoonists for a newspaper that ever that people read that is being threatened by any radical elements. After that there were I was interviewed on the radio. There were they just found every American cartoonist they could to talk about the profession and how brave you people are to do what you do. And it made me laugh because I don't there's no American cartoonist that I can point to uh, that could uh, engender that kind of response from anybody. I think they're very soft. I think that their editorial stance on things is the newspaper stance on the things, and generally newspapers aren't going to be that daring. Artists are not invited to the table anymore. There's been so many attempts at censorship as legislation through time. You know, that is power attempting to, to dim the voice of honesty. Artists are no longer invited to the table because they actually speak um, honestly and they start to pull apart the fingers of, of uh, big business and, and powerful entities that are try trying to strangle humanity. One of the things that I want people to come away with after they look at my art is that there's no such thing as a thought crime. You know, that people can engage with uh, any uh, concept of, or idea and communicate that, that idea and not be ashamed. You learn about yourself as much as you learn about other people when you do that. Let's all sing. Kumbaya. <laughs>